Hi, welcome to this video. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the head of the positioning hammer project. And the hammer head video should be quite short because we've already seen many of the operations that we're going to have to perform to complete this part. Now you may remember that in the hammer handle series of videos, we've already seen how to surface the end of a part. We've also seen how to do layout work on the surface plate with the V-block and our height gauge. We've also seen how to turn an accurate diameter and produce a thread clearance groove at the end of that diameter. And finally, we've seen in our four-jaw chuck centering video how to install and center square parts in a four-jaw chuck. So we know all these things already, so let's just run through them quickly and get to the part of the project that concerns us most, which is the turning of that tapered surface. In other words, what we haven't done on our other projects. So let's get over to the lathe and get going with the project. So I've installed my four-jaw chuck, and I've installed my part in the four-jaw chuck. Now I installed the part in the chuck quite deeply because this first operation is just a surfacing operation. Now, I haven't centered the part very well because we're just surfacing. It doesn't have to be well centered at this point. I've also installed my general purpose turning tool, the same one that we used on the hammer handle. And I've oriented it to surface the end of my part. I've set my RPM to about 400 and we're ready to cut. So let's do that. You're going to have to watch out for the feed. There's a strong temptation here to feed quite rapidly at the start of the cut of this part because we're cutting a square part. And at the very beginning, the tool touches only the tips, so there's no resistance to our cut. Be careful, feed at a normal rate, even if you start off by cutting only the tips. We can now pull the part from the chuck, deburr it, and move over to the surface plate for our layout operation. Like I said, we're not going to go over everything that we've already done on the hammer handle. It would just be too long a video for nothing. So we went over to the surface plate and we scribed four lines using our height gauge and a V-block to stabilize the part. I scribed the first line at 13 millimeters from the reference surface that we just produced. I scribed the second line at 36 millimeters, which is the center of the finished part. I scribed the third line at 59 millimeters and a fourth line at 72 millimeters. So we're now ready to reinsert this part into the four jaw chuck. But this time we're going to set it so that it sticks out by half its length. That's why we scribe that 36 millimeter line. We're also going to have to center this part in the four jaw chuck very precisely. Because once we've surfaced the end of this part, we're going to finish this whole end of this hammer head without moving the part in the four jaw chuck. We don't want to continuously have to re-center the part. It could get very tedious and long. My part is now centered. I'll be able to come and surface the end of this part, removing the excess material and bringing my part to its final length of 72 millimeters. So I'm done surfacing the second end and my part is at its final length of 72 millimeters. 
So I can now reorient the tool so that I can turn that shoulder, the one that's going to end up being threaded. Now remember, avoid the temptation of moving your part here. We've installed it so that it sticks halfway out so that we don't have to recenter our part each time that we move the tool. So you've seen how long it takes to center the part. Don't move it now. Leave it as it is. Now let's move on to the parallel turning. No explanations are required here because we're turning the same diameter, 9.8 millimeters, and the same shoulder, as well as the same groove, and die cutting the same thread as we've done on our hammer handle. The only difference here is that this thread is one millimeter shorter. Go see the video, Hammer Handle Part 3, if you need a refresher about these operations. Well, basically the end of this part is complete. There's just one last thing that needs to be done, and that is to produce the taper. So, we've surfaced the part, we've turned our diameter, we've made our groove, and we've produced the thread. And now comes the time to sit down and do some calculations, because the angle that we want to cut to produce the taper on the end of this part is 14 degrees. But where does that angle come from? Let's take a look. So the triangle we want to resolve is right here. 3.96 millimeters high, 15.6 millimeters long, and our 14 degrees, well, is going to end up right here. But how do we find that? Because the 14 degrees isn't on the blueprint. Well, let's look at each dimension. The 15.6 millimeters comes from the blueprint by subtracting two lengths on our drawing. The 3.96 millimeters doesn't come from the blueprint. And for that we have to calculate. So we'll start with what we have here. We're looking at our part on the end. We have our square section of 19 by 19 millimeters. And we have our radius of the center circle. It's going to, this taper is, starts as a circle and ends as a square 15.6 millimeters further down. So the radius for this circle is 9.5, or if you prefer, half of 19 millimeters. And what we need to find here is D, this little end, or if we prefer, the difference between the circle we want to start with and the square that we want to finish on. And the square is point to point. So D, this little end part, well that's what I need to find to be able to resolve this triangle and find my angle. Well how do I find D? Well, if I knew the distance from the center to the point of the square section, well all I'd have to do is do that distance minus the 9.5 radius and what would be left 
would be this little short section that I'm calling D. But I don't know this distance. But I do know one thing. Pythagore can tell me what C would be, or if you prefer, the distance from point to point of this square. And for that, all I have to do is find out two sides of the square that aren't the hypotenuse, and then resolve the center with his equation. So, I know that I have a right angle triangle here, you can see. And in right angle triangles, I know that sine squared plus side squared equals hypotenuse squared. And that's what I wrote up here. So if you say C squared, C here is the overall length, it's what we're looking for. C squared equals A squared plus B squared. So if I want to isolate the C, I can say C equals square root of A squared plus B squared. And if I resolve that on my calculator, I find that C equals 26.87 millimeters. Well, C overall equals 26.87. Well, what I'm looking for is D, or if you prefer, just the little end of one side of that C that we've just found. So how are we going to do that? Well, look what I wrote here. D is what I'm looking for, this little short end. There's four of them all together. To find the D, I'm going to say C divided by 2. C, that I've just found, divided by 2 gives me half, minus 9.5, which is my radius. So C divided by 2 minus 9.5 leaves me D, the little end. And if I figure that out, D equals C over 2 minus 9.5, D equals 3.93 millimeters. And that is what I wrote up here. Now, this still doesn't give me the 14 degrees that we've been looking for from the very beginning. But a little trigonometry will help us with that. So I need some room. I'm going to erase this and come back in a few seconds with the final result of our trig calculation. Okay, so I've erased the, the other calculations, and we're back with our final calculations. Remember, what we're looking for is this angle right here, which is the angle at which we're going to set the compound rest for cutting our taper. And we've known from the start, because I said it, that it's going to be 14, and we're looking for how to get that. Well, our final calculation, now that we know the height and the length of this right angle triangle, well, is going to be to find this angle using basic trigonometry. So, tan of an unknown angle is equal to the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. In our case, tan of the unknown angle is going to be equal to 3.93 millimeters divided by 15.6. And that's what we have right here. So tan of the unknown angle equals 0.25192. Now that's a constant. So what we're going to have to do is find what the constant is, what the angle is, for just our angle and not tan of the angle. And for that, we're going to divide both sides by tan. Now, if I divide this side, tan theta by tan, I'm allowed to do the same operation on the other side. As long as I keep things equal or even, it's no problem. But the problem here is tan theta divided by tan, I take away the tan, I end up with just the angle. But instead of dividing by tangent here, which you can't do on most of your calculators, well, just multiply by tangent at the minus one power. And Multiplying to power minus 1 is the same thing as dividing by tangent. So what we have here is our tan of our angle is 0.25192. Our angle is going to be 0.25192 times tangent at the power of minus 1. 
If I calculate that on the calculator, I end up with an angle of 14.14 degrees. Now this is the angle at which we're going to set our compound rest. It's really not that accurate. The scale that I can see on the compound rest might permit me to see a quarter of a degree at best. So we're just going to forget about the 0.14 degrees and say, let's cut this angle at 14 degrees. Remember, this taper is not a machine taper. It's an aesthetic taper. It's just for the looks. So 14 degrees will do just fine. So let's get back to the machine and set up our compound rest. So I want 14 degrees from my longitudinal axis and I want to cut the part on the side closest to me. So zero degrees from longitudinal axis is right here and 14 degrees would be right here. So I can tighten everything up and reinstall my tool that I removed for safety. And now using my cross axis to set my depth of cut and my compound rest axis to feed my cut, I'm going to cut in successive passes the taper on the square section of this part. To get a cleaner, crisper cut by reducing vibration, you should lock your longitudinal feed. During a cutting operation, it's a good practice to always lock unused axes. Now that I've taken a few passes, I notice that small triangles are appearing on the corners of the part. Now these triangles are going to get progressively larger the deeper I cut, and eventually they'll form a parabolic curve on the side of the part, because a parabolic curve can be described as a cone traversing a flat surface. Now, the corners of these triangles are going to get progressively closer, eventually touching. And when they touch, and just barely touch, they're going to form a circle. It's at that point that I know that the circular end of this taper and the distance across flats on the square section is the same. And that's where I want to stop. We're getting close here, but the corners are not quite touching, so a couple of thousandths of an inch more and we'll be okay. This end of the part is complete. We can now pull the part from the lathe and start over all the operations once again because the opposite end of this part is identical to the one that we've just produced. Happy machining!